This is just a big, can I talk? This, uh, this is Courtney Burns interviewing Leonard Jindra in Floral Park, New York, October 2nd, 2019. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Jindra. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, I'm going to ask you questions about your, uh, your, yourself and your service during the war. Um, feel free to, you know, answer however you'd like. If you need me to clarify anything, you know, just, just ask. Um, but, you know, give as much detail as you can, as much as you'd like, and whatever you can remember would be great. Okay, can you state your name for me, please, your full name? As, you, as I told you, that at my age now, I have a trouble hearing. Uh -huh. So I'm occasionally, I may say, what did you say, because I do have sure, that's, that's fine. hearing, and my hearing does not help me much. Okay. All right, can you state your full name for me? Tell me your name. My name is Leonard Jindra. And when were you born? I was born June 15, 1921. And where? I was born in Czech Republic. Oh, really? When, and when did you come to the United States? I came to the United States in 1938. Okay. And what, what did your parents do? My, they had a farm. My parents had a farm. When they arrived here? When they arrived in the United States, they were farmers? No. Uh, they had a farm there in Czech Republic. Oh, okay. I was the only one that came here. Uh huh. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I had two brothers. Oh, and you all came? And, and one adopted sister. Mm -hmm. And why did they come here? I, they decided to stay there. Uh -huh. uh, they, they didn't want to. I was, I wanted to, what I read, uh, my aunt. I had two aunts here, my mother's aunt and uh, Another two ants they had. They used to send a magazine, and in those days it was about uh, Buffalo Bill, and I was more or less, uh, oh, I admired the, the cowboys that, were, the, that was there. So when you came to the United States, where did you live? I lived in Jersey. What part? Uh, West New York, New Jersey. That was Hudson County. Okay, and so you were, what, 16 or 17 when you came here? Yes, I was 16. Okay, and so did you start school? No, I was just going to evening school. Okay, and um, how did you end up uh, in the Army? Well, when, when the Hitler started to, when he invaded Czech Republic, I, I did not like, like that much. And the little that I knew, about politics. I knew that Hitler, when I, he kept on saying, Deutschland über alles, which means not that I speak German, I don't know just a little bit German that I knew, because I took French in high school. I knew more French than I knew German. And But this I understood, that means Deutschland über alles, Germany above all. And I thought that it was not fair. And uh, in a way, in those days, that was because my mother, before I left, she gave me good lecture. She says, remember, you are going to a new country. You have to be loyal to the country that you live in. If you have to do, uh, there is an army, you have to join and protect that country that you are with. He said, she said, forget about Czech Republic now, you will be in the United States. And somehow it sticked in my, sticked it in my head. I wanted to join. Then I, in 1940, 42, when Hitler, uh, Hitler's invaded in, in, in Czech Republic, 1942, when he declared a war, I uh, I went to Draftport and I said I was not. They did not put me because I was not citizen yet. At Draftport, I said put me in that I would go in the army, be next to be go to Newark because in New that in Newark in Jersey we used to go to Newark and there you were inducted. So I, they done it. I still remember because it was easy, easy name, the lady that was in at the draft board, her name was Mrs. White. So 
when I, in the work, all at once, the rice seed. He says, no. He says, you are not in the, go in the army. So I said, why not? He said, you are 4F. I had a hernia. So I didn't have that, that much money because in those days, I took any kind of job that I could get. I did washing, I knew a little cooking, short order cook, so I could make money. I did make that much money. I was making only $15 a week. So when I came back, I asked, uh, to my, I live with my mother's aunt. I says, uh, they did not take me in the army because I have a hernia. So she says, well, what are you going to do? I says, well, I will be operated. And as I understand, they do not want to pay for it. And I don't have that good much money. I, I ask her, how much is it going to cost me? She says, I don't know, but I know the hospital is on, it was on 42nd Street between 3rd Avenue and that East River. They call it that hospital. They specialize on, uh, specialize on hernia. So I went there. I don't know if it was next day or afterwards. And they wanted $300. I didn't have $300. So my answer is, well, if you need it badly, I will lend you the money. So she let me the money. I had operation there, so I could get in the, have it done. It cost me $300 in those days. You had to stay after the operation. You had to stay in those days, I think 10 days, and they give you ether. That was horrible, that ether that you had to smell. But, but anyway, I got by. So then afterwards, when I had that operation, I went back to Mrs. White. At the drug port, she says, no, you are too early, just rest, rest a little while. So I, uh, I rested, then when I came, Meanwhile, I had a job. I got a job at the uh, jewelry store, which I, my grandfather, about the watches. I could not. I had to work in that jewelry that I got. My boss, he was a wonderful man, Mr. Red. He was in charge of all the draft boards that were in that area, that Hudson County, in that West New York. He says to me, you know, you are dumb. I said, why? He said, you had a good chance to stay out of the service. I said, no, I want to get in. So he was, then, I don't know, then they called me. Uh, and I was, I was accepted in the army. When I was in Norwalk in those days, they asked, they asked me, what branch of service do you want to go into? I says, Army. But Why did you choose the Army? I, I don't know. I just wanted the Army. Okay. Because I saw the movie uh, Sergeant York. And that really got me more introduced. And it, it, that. It was, they made, in that Sergeant York, they made it so easy the way he was Sergeant York. The Germans, he was from South, I forgot what, in that uh, area, Gen uh, uh, Gary Cooper played the Sergeant York. And I was so, so interested, I thought the war is so easy, and anyway, as I did not understand in those days, the way Hollywood, Picture made a movie. He he whistled like a turkey, and the Germans Germans uh, stick their heads. He knocked off a couple of them, and the others they surrender. He came back. Uh, he got the Germans. He took I think it was fifteen or twenty. They surrendered to him. I think he got Congressional Medal of Honor. 
and some kind of drugs are awarded, he made it. It was so, so easy, the war was so easy in that picture, the way they made it, the way Hollywood made it. Now, before, before we go in further about your um, joining the army, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned uh, that uh, Hitler invading Czechoslovakia and then moving across Europe inspired you to join. How did you feel after Pearl Harbor? How I felt after Pearl Harbor? Yes. What was your reaction? I, I was furious that the Japan would dare to bomb the United States because I knew some of the fellas already that were in the Marine Corps and they said they are leaving. They, I thought uh, they, they are involved in there someplace. I didn't know where they were. I didn't know much about Pearl Harbor. Uh, Pearl Harbor, but I knew they were out there in Pacific. And when I uh, when I started to get the uh, what I heard, what they did to Arizona, there was a person that I, their son was in on that ship, Arizona. I think he's in tomb. There are GIs that are inside that, that Arizona. And when a little picture that I have seen, and when I heard, first time I was working because it was before Christmas. Before uh, that was on Sunday, that I, I was Saturday, because we were getting ready for Christmas. And I remember Walter Winchell made an announcement that Pearl Harbor was bombed. And fella says, that's a joke. He was a, he says, such a commentator and make, make such a remark about the war that they bought. And pretty soon one of the, one of the fellas was, he was in the service. He knocked on the door because his brother was working there for a ride. He said, they made an announcement in the theater to report back to the bases or army camps, and they bombed Pearl Harbor. So then I did believe that it was that Walter Winchell was not making story. It really happened. And how did your parents feel when you decided you wanted to enlist? By then, my parents, I could not write to them because Hitler did not let let the mail come out. My mother, uh, didn't, my father, meanwhile, he died when I was young. But my mother, I could not write to my mother because it was Hitler would not permit it. Mm -hmm. So she did not know that I went in the service. Okay. So you didn't have any communication with her during no I at the beginning not. of the war. No. Okay. Um, Oh, so now you started to say, so you had your hernia operation and then you were accepted and you decided you wanted to enlist in the army. What happened next? Well, then I, when I was in Fort Dix, I was sent to Fort Dix and from Fort Dix they shipped us to Camp Wheeler, Georgia. That's where I got my basic training. In, uh, when I finished my basic training, they, uh, basic training, they shipped us to Fort Meade, Maryland, that was the uh, part of, I think that's where the 29th Division started in 29, and from Fort Meade we stayed for a while, I think about four days, and we f had to fill out the uh, life insurance, so we, and we were told that we will go overseas, and from there they shipped us to Camp Kilmer. I think it's part of New York, but it's on Jersey side. From Camp Kilmer, we stayed there, I don't know how many days, maybe three or four days. And then middle of the night, they woke us up and they said, you are going to go on, a, go overseas now. So they put us on, a, I think it was six by six trucks. There they put us on a little, 
what they call a ferry that they call it down the Hudson River that we went there from the Hudson we went down the Hudson River on Liberty ship that was about middle of the night a rule was no talking when we got on the ship. We got on Liberty ship and we were told no one is allowed to go on the deck. And then we heard in uh, we heard engines going off and next thing we knew one of the fellows that was both familiar with the boat, he says, we are moving. And I don't know how somebody passed, somebody realized, uh, uh, could see it. I know I didn't see it. He said, we just passed Statue of Liberty. The next thing we And what time of year was this? That was in 1943. In the summer or fall? Do you, do you remember the month? Oh, what's that? Do you remember what month you left? Oh, gee, I don't know. Okay. I do not remember that anymore. So you're with the 29th Division? Yeah, from there. Do you know what, remember which regiment? Yes, 115 Regiment, 115. And what company? Uh, I was in uh, F Company, and F Company, 2nd Squad, 2nd Battalion of 115 Regiment, 29th Division. So how was the trip over on the Liberty ship? Well, we, uh, we, the instructions that we got, because when we joined the convoy, far as you look, there were all kinds of ships, destroyers, there were uh, regular boats, all kinds of, all the ships, you thought all the ships of the United States out on our convoy. And we were told if we should get hit, the convoy will not stop. It will just continue. They said, don't worry, the fellas will be picked up later on. One of the ships, we were, it took us about 20 days before we, we 20 days to cross because slowly as we were going, the convoy was getting slow and slower. So the merchant marines and sailors that were there, they said they left for Africa. They left for Africa. We just kept on going. We landed in Liverpool in England after 20 days. And from there, they, they put us on the middle of the night, again on a train, and we landed in uh, Launceston. And from Launceston, we loaded on the trucks, which took us to to our camp that people with 29 division. And that was, where was, do you recall where that was? Where the camp was in England? Yes, it was in Loudston, outside okay. of Loudston. All right. Not in the Loudston, outside of Loudston. Mm -hmm. And so what did you do when you got there? Well, they put us, they assigned us to a place there. And we naturally, we were just sitting, sleeping, finishing. It was the middle of the night, one time, I don't know. As we were uh, sitting and sleeping, next morning when we got there, they gave us uh, white white bags. Some of the fellas, that was a joke. He says, if you should get hit, that's where we'll, they will put you in that bag. They took us over to the uh, to one of the barracks that had straw. They said, fill up the straw, that will be your mattress. So we fill up those, those bags, and that was our mattress. They took us on it in the, uh, in the hut that we had, which was located near the latrine, near the infirmary, across the way from the infirmary. And we had a choice because there was, we were the second replacement for the 29th. Because originally, as we understood later on, the 29th, when they went overseas, they were only, they were only 5,000 strong. And they went on uh, Queen Elizabeth. And 
so we were the second replacement for them by then. Then afterwards, every month, some more. So when we eventually were over 30,000, division was over 30,000. Meanwhile, we got a training on wars. We stayed in, in England. When we were, that's where afterwards it was on uh, on Moss when we had we had several they call a dry run. Middle of the night we would go and then we would, they said this is a. Then finally. They they said since you stuff whatever you have send it home give it to mail clerk and he will mail it home. That was the real stuff that we had. Naturally, we were on the six by six truck. They put the flap down. We didn't know where we were going. As we understand, we were in Plymouth in England. That's when we landed on a big, big boat. What were your dry runs like? You mentioned the dry run trainings. What, what, what were they like? Dry run was not what's like. It was just like a, a practice. And what did you do? Uh, I, they t whatever they told us to, to go on at that, it, they said, this is it, and it was the dry run. Then they took us back to the camp. Did you, you practice um, getting off the ships, the landing trip? Well, uh, meanwhile, trip? while we had a training, we practiced how to get on the net, going on the, going on the landing craft. Uh -huh. We had it several times that we had it. And the uh, same way on the moors, house-to-house -house fighting that we had in, in Plymouth. In Plymouth, uh, the Germans, uh, they bombed alongside of that railroad. So those houses, we, there were no one in it, they were bombed. So we practiced, that was house-to-house -house fighting. And on most, we practiced how to advance. We used to go on the moors and sleep on the moors in the camp, we were not in the camp. I would say maybe two or three nights we were in the camp. Rest of the time we spent on the moors, uh, sleeping there, taking fox holes, and to make believe that we are attacking, uh, attacking there, and then go on the beach where we went on uh, from the big boat. Uh, incidentally, when we landed on the, uh, we liked to go on the boats because sailors, they had a good coffee. When we got on a uh, better coffee than what we had in the army, somehow the army didn't make such a good coffee as Navy made it. Did you know where you were going and what you were training for? Well, they told us that we will land in France. Uh, someplace. We didn't know where. Meanwhile, uh, we got all kinds of lecture. Uh, Patton spoke to us twice. In those days, one of the lectures that stick us, we asked each other, what did he mean by it? Because Patton says in one of his speeches that he, he said, after you get wounded, and mo most of you that come back, you are no good to me. We didn't know what, it, what he meant by that. We found out after you were wounded what happened, why he, what it meant. But that time when he told us, he didn't know because he, Patton, he was, meanwhile he says, don't fool or don't let anybody tell you, you will find the enemy that is well trained. And he says, they know all the tricks in the world. He pictured it the way it was, and he was right. He was right. They were the Germans. They were trained, smart, clever, booby traps. And uh, the story he, he would say in uh, what happened in Africa. So, how did that make you feel when, uh, after you heard that kind of warning from Patton? Well, we we were young. The, if I should say, we were not, some of us were dumb. We didn't realize what the war really is like, or landing is, landing is really 
Well, like, they made us all kinds of promises. They said, when you land on the beach, Erko will bomb the beach, uh, bomb the beach, and they will bomb the area. They will destroy the mines. They will make holes on the beach so you could jump from a hole to when we got there, the accord did not bomb the beach. There were no holes in it. The only holes that came in there little ones when the German shells landed in there, they made a holes. So you you left um, uh, you arrived at Plymouth and you were preparing then to leave? Well when we got in Plymouth then we got on a big boat. Okay. And middle of uh, middle of the night, most of us, I know I lost my watch in the, I wasn't the only one. I lost my watch in the crab game. So I didn't know what it was. All I know it was dark. They woke us up and we got some meal on it. One fellow made a remark, this could be our last meal. And when we came there, then we knew just exactly when they told us how to line up to get on. We were instructed there will be no talking, everything. And when you went down, down the ramp on the net, you count to yourself one, two, three, and you went down, made it to you because it was noisy as the sea goes, noisy. So each of us, we already had a training for it, what to do. And we knew when we get out the beach to go, for, to go forward. <laughs> Afterwards, when we had a reunion, some of us swore that we saw American flag on top of the beach, way on top. And there was a flag. So another fellow, he was from Virginia. He said, you know, you guys, he said, that's why we came there for, to protect the flag. There was no flag. What do you think, Hitler would have put a flag there for you? So I guess we were imagining it, that there was a flag up there, we ran up there, up on the, on the top. He thought there was a flag. It could be, he was probably, he was right. <clears throat> it was our imagina imagination. Now when you crossed, was there, was, was there a lot of people in the boat? Was it crowded in the ship? Well, there were only troops, you mean going... In your troop transport going, going across, to the was beach? It, yeah, was it crowded? It was just the soldiers, the soldiers, each of us were assigned. Mm -hmm. We knew just exactly, afterwards, I was there almost, what was it, almost nine months in England. The training that we knew, we knew just exactly what to do. You line up here, first squad, second squad, this platoon that will land on the boat, allowed a land on a go there and go to the ramp and they said it was most of it was if they were saying something but they told us you will not understand it so we went by signals little that we could see what did you see and hear as you were approaching the beach yeah. bombardment you heard it or saw it or both you saw the bombardment that's all uh -huh. yes because that, our artillery was not there yet. It was Navy that was uh, hitting the beach. They were acting like a artillery. Mm -hmm. So you climbed all over the side of the boat, the ship, and yeah, did you go in the water? And you get on the big boat, then all at once it started to move. Mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes some people, if you talk to them, they say, "What, uh, what line? What do they, what do they call it?" In other words, the way they talk, some people that don't know what they are talking about, they were not there. What group were you in? One boat could go. One boat could go. They got stuck on a hedgehog. 
another one, you just kept on going. Where the sailors, they kept on going to the beach, trying to get get in between, because a lot of them got stuck on that, that hedgehog or sand, uh, sand bars. So till you got to the beach, and when the ramp went down, then you knew you have to go home, or you have to go out. And it all depends where it, our boat, some of the, a lot of fellas, they drown. They were not, because we had that weight. And when those clever boys in Pentagon, the bull taker was, when you lay there, if it's, they said, if it is heavy, you lay on your back. Twist your belt and everything will fall off. Yes, got stuck because there was a, your rifle was attached, your gas mask was there, your ammunition that you had, and all that. If it got stuck, some fellas, they drowned. It did not, it did not loosen itself. Not that, that they were hit. How deep was the water that you jumped into? How deep? In certain places, you knew you had. I, I was not. I'm not a good swimmer, but that much I could do. You would go like this and try to. When you started to feel sand, then you tried to walk to to the beach. Mm -hmm. So, you got off the ship. You're running to the to the beach, and you. The, our Navy's bombing the shoreline, what were the Germans doing? Uh, they kept out blasting at us. You saw the fire coming over and you knew there was a big, well, I don't know what that is, for publication is in our army way. Everything, the situation is normal, everything is fucked up. That was screwed up. We were at the beach, we were there really for a while quiet. Uh, trying to get off, so when we finally started to go up the hill, going up the hill. In fact, now I'm going to a reunion. I, I know I saw him, General Coda, one star general. He was supposed to say, the only people that will stay on the beach are the dead people. Let's move. 29, let's go. So we started to go up. And if you were lucky enough, somebody walked ahead of you already, you made sure you stepped on his things because if you, it was mine. If you went some, which you could see. You could see arm here, head here, torso here. The mines were blown. There were a lot of mines, it was mine. So you try to step on his, his steps to be safe and keep going. As we were trying, trying. So what did you think about as you were moving forward? I mean, that must have been pretty scary. I don't know. As we, when we get together, when we were in France this time for 75th anniversary, it was mainly combat men, only combat men, ex-combat men. Each of us had at least one or three Purple Hearts that were in there. One fellow said, let's say, let's say it, we were stupid that we went up in Pentagon, those little boys and the rich boys, they were sitting there, they had a grand time, and we did like, we went up, we didn't, we didn't realize that we could get killed. I, know, I, I thought I will not get killed. We just went. And if somebody blew next to you, you just kept on going. Because that's what we were told. No matter what happens, keep going. So you made it across the beach and up to the hill. How was it going up the hill? Tough. In fact, I called this fella up because I was not able to go there. He was my platoon sergeant. He was from Virginia. He passed away 
he was older than I was. He was about three or four. He was uh, my platoon sergeant. Uh, when they went there, about my wife was still alive. She was. If I am going to, going to France that time, I did not was there since then. Since the day I was there, maybe three times. If I am gone, I did not go because my wife was not feeling well and she was getting treatment, chemotherapy. She, so we did not go. So when I knew they are coming back, I asked him, I called him up in Virginia, I said, how was it? He said, Leonard, do you remember on D-Day, we ran, we ran up like a rabbit. This time we went like turtles. He passed away, I think, three or four years ago. So, as you were moving up the hill, did you, um, was there uh, the, the German fire increasing, or was it the oh, same, yes. or was you it saw, more machine gun fire at this point? You, uh, some of them, they fired, uh, the Navy, they fired over our head, the Germans fired pillbox, there was a pillbox on the right side, pillbox on the left side, and pillboxes there. You saw it go. They had a traces. You could, you could not, and the noise, you could not hear. So you must have been pretty close to the pillboxes. Yeah. You don't want to think about it. Okay. Some of the fellows says you advance. Funny part of a grown man. You, you may not believe it, but grown men would call, Mommy, Mommy, when they were laying there. When you saw, when you saw those arms, legs, those, they stepped on the mine. I don't know, as they, as we talk about it on D-Day, we were stupid that we went like that. We just kept going. But you made it to the top, right? Yes. And how, what, was, what happened when you got up to the top? We tried to get organized, get together. So all the men from your company yes, so assembled? It was a different, you knew, from my company, yes, or from my uh, regiment, because we were mixed. Then uh, when you got on the top, there were people from 115 regiment, 116, some of them. There was even some people from first division that were there. Funny part of it, when I was approaching the beach, I took a chance, one of those hedgehogs, I needed rest. There was a hedgehog, I went to it to hold on to it and rest a little bit, and there was always soldier. I realized that he was a first division man. And as I saw, he was an officer. So we started, we started to talk. I said, so he told me because as he, as an officer, he knew he had. A, he said the 29th is over here. Uh, let's see, if you like this? He says here. Uh, 29th, he says, mine is over here. First division is here. We were rest. We were, had to rest. And when I went to with my son to Union League one time. There was this general that was there supposed to give us lecture at Union, Union League in New York City. As he's telling me, he started to talk about the uh, D-Day. So I told him, I, I said, he said, my father was with the First Division. I said, yeah, I met First Division. 
first time that I really met him, first time, uh, first division, was on Omaha Beach, and he was an officer. And I'm telling him that he was. So he said, you know, this is coincidence. My father was telling me about that the hedgehog. He had a talk with a 29er. Maybe it was you. Then we had one of the, in Roanoke, outside Roanoke, there is a museum. One, from D-Day, people went there to, I was, uh, I donated money also when they built that museum, they built that museum. Speeches that were given, at that time I think it was Bush was the pre president. There was, they made an announcement, First Division men got Medal of Honor. And this, this uh, general he told me my father got Medal of Honor. I said, yes. It could have been, he said, maybe you, he was talking to you. I said, it could be. He was a First Division and he was an officer. Yeah. Could be. So that after that day, after that first day, when did you uh, finally feel like you were somewhat safe and get to sleep? Yeah, we started to get we started to get organized. You stay guard. In other words, you have to stay guard, and then afterwards. The Germans started to counterattack us. So when it's no one sleeps, everybody stands guard. So we stay guard. Everybody stayed up, and we were hungry. By then, uh, some of us had a sea rations. You know, sea ration is a can, like a Coca Cola that you have it. Some of them didn't have anything, they lost everything. So you share, you share what we had at sea ration. Funny part of it, you may be very fussy. If they had a spoon or you went there with the fingers, if you didn't have a spoon or fork, put a hat, you eat it. Another one, pass the can, pass. Everybody would have a little drink, share it. Now you mentioned that you had a purple heart. When when did you when when, when did you uh, when were you wounded? I was in first born purple heart that I got in here, the shrapnel. The shrapnel hit me here and I was bleeding like a pig. So they medics they sent me to first aid station. I didn't go behind the lines. Behind the lines just the what they call battalion first aid station. They patched me up and I stayed there about two or three days. And then back again on the line. That was first time. And when was that? Uh, when? Yeah. Was that, that wasn't on the day one, was it? No, no. That was, I don't know how many days after D-Day. Oh, it was, it was after we were ambushed. After we were ambushed. I don't know what day. When, well, tell me about the ambush. Well, yeah, we lost. We already had lost a lot of men. And when we were ambushed, the way it is, somebody that kept the record, they said that we lost close to 200 men by being ambushed. They were killed, captured, and uh, whatnot. That was, I think, October 10th. Not all. Yeah, it was ten. After three days, several days after we went, we were already hungry, no food, and they said we will go. It was during the night. One fellow, the way he looked up, he said it's after twelve. That we will have to go attack because hundred seventy fifth. A division tried to attack and they got beaten in there, so he was supposed to outflank it. 
to go there, so we were marching. Nobody was, nobody was talking. But meanwhile, the Germans, they opened up dikes. There was a water there. We went through the, you see dead animals coming there, come down. We went through that thing. So when we got on the dry land, we kept, we had to go. We were told, where we go, we will get a hot meal. So nobody was talking. And as you march as the infantry, when you march column, you send out the column to go. I was on a sent on a column, then they called the columns back to go on it. We kept on marching. I know it was after twelve o'clock. So when we get in the field we were assigned, you will stay here. The second battalion will stay here. When we got there, I was taking my pack off. All at once, all the hell in the world broke loose. Then you could see the flashes because it was dark already. The Germans, they were waiting for us. That's where we lost our colonel. We scattered all different things. Next morning, I, when I was, when I was there, I saw, it was dark yet. I heard some kind of noise made. So I looked, it was one of our men from G Company. So then we suddenly, we had, uh, when we got finished, when the daylight came, this time we didn't sleep and we didn't have anything. All at once, we, you, you lost your hunger. You were not hunger, uh, hungry. It was about 10 or 15 of us. When we came, we came into more men and finally we, uh, finally we came there. There was an uh, officer. So they told us where to, where to go. So next, we got together and then we, we heard the start and to hear some of the fellas when the colonel was killed. The Germans, they kept, when they captured him, they gave him one of the bullhorns. He says, I was not there. This is what GI, the GI stuck both there. And they gave it to Colonel. They said, tell you men to surrender. So he was supposed to say, I did not train my men to surrender. I trained to kill you bastards. They shot him. That's where we lost him. And we lost a lot of officers, a lot of men, and some who were captured as a prisoners. The story is that between 150 and 200, we lost that mm -hmm. night. Up to 10. And your first injury then was after that, you said? Or before that? What's that? Your first injury was in your leg was yeah, after? Yeah, but I got it in the leg. Was that before or after yeah. that ambush? No, this was, this was after. Okay. After the uh, ambush. They sent me, I didn't go back. So yeah, I was just uh, with the uh, eight first aid station headquarters, which was a little bit behind the lines, maybe 200 yards behind the lines. Then the second one that I got injured. You don't want, worry if you have, if you have coffee or any kind of drink that you have, you pass it to each other from the same same class. You don't worry about it. So your second purple heart, your second injury, you were ta starting to tell me about your second. Oh yeah, the second one I got, this was then we took over, in Normandy we took over St. Lowe. We took over St. Lowe. 
And meanwhile, before we got to St. Lo, like actually that was about 30 days or whatever it was. When I was there last time, I looked for the place, places that I remember. It does not look like the places I remember especially that I was looking for about the house. It's not there. In France, it has changed the hedgerows. The farmers, since they got a bulldozers, some of those hedgerows, they were very wide. This time, I guess that they got these uh, equipment. They made the hedgerows smaller. They gained uh, land and the uh, a lot of sunken roads disappeared. I only saw one sunken they had there were a lot of them. And this the place that I looked for when we went on the patrol. This fellow he, uh, he was from Jersey. He was my scout by then. I got a staff I was a staff sergeant. He he looks down, he says, Sergeant, come on. So he said, I'm going to get Section 8. I see house moving. So, so, so sure enough, the house was rotating on it. So he called Lieutenant. He, told him, he said, I told him, I said, I'm going to get a Section 8 too. He's going to get a Section 8. So Lieutenant looks at it. The house was rotating. He said, that's three of us. We're going to get a Section 8. The Germans had it on a trail. We saw it afterwards when we, when we captured St. Lo. It was like on a track. There were guns in the window that they had. And it was a house that looked up the road and he could rotate, he could fire here, he could fire on that thing. I looked for that, for that road, I couldn't sign this change. Same way, when we went on a patrol one time, this was also in St. Lo, I looked for that area when you were the last time because we were on the bus. I couldn't find that. So there was, a, there was, when we were coming back, one of the fellas, he says, look at that. There's a crowd, crowds are coming over. There's a flat area, like this, flat. So we had a fellow from Texas. That guy always carried his lasso. He may not, he had a hand grenade, he had a lasso. He said, let's, let's run over there. So we got near the woods. He said they have to come over. They have to come here on this road. So I didn't know. He knew. He got a training someplace in Camp Croft. I didn't know that time about it, but he knew. So he got that. He tied a rope, his lasso, on the tree on that side, on the road. Take it like that. When the crowds he had one one of those uh, uh, bicycle, the side, what they call it, side... Uh, side car? Uh, yes, side car that he had next to it. So when they came over, he pulled over, naturally. One of them, I think he broke, the driver broke his, uh, had a broken neck, he was not moving anymore. And the other one, one fellow finished him off. So I looked for that area, I couldn't recognize it. It's, <coughs> France has changed. It's same way on the beach. It, I don't think that it's in their pillboxes, but the area, there is our monument in the middle. Rangers have it on that side. And uh, it looks altogether different. It doesn't matter. And beach, clean. Nice. How many times have you been back? 
I went, I think, three times. One time, my wife, maybe twice or three times, I don't know. Some of the fellas, they go there every five years, some every ten years. As I say, last time we, were, we didn't make it because my wife did not feel well. Yeah. Do you have reunions? With uh, do you have reunions here in the United States? Yes. Do you go this to them? Yeah, I have it in Virginia. Uh -huh. But when we were there in France, the French they believe in parade, and I was the only GI there. The others, it was about forty of us that were children or uh, children of the deceased, or or grandchildren. They want to see where their grandfather was killed. They wanted to see cemetery and they want to see the beach. Some of them, they were there. So when we got in wherever village, we, we went to the French stage to, stage to parade. And especially uh, my my regiment did not take that place, go down that hill. What, what was the name of it? My memory is not what it used to be. 116 regiment took that place there. And the Frenchmen, they said, you Americans lost 77 men by making us free on that, air, on that area. Vila, Lever, Vila, something like that. Because that was where you had to go down a ravine and the crowds could just blast the hell out, out of them when fellas were going down. They said, as this Frenchman, he said, you lost 77 men, and we are grateful to you. That was 116 regiment, took that place. We were to the, to their left. Did you capture any Germans, your, your unit? Yes. How were they? When you, when... You know, funny part of it, I never knew this, and a lot of GIs, we did not know it. When we were the last time, this fella was telling us on it, which the Germans had more democratic army than we have. In German, they said, you stay on the line. Let's, let's, this German, this fella was telling, GI was telling him, the German prisoner told him. When he captured him, he says, you know, two weeks ago I was in Berlin. I was drinking cognac. And he said, how come you are here now? He says, now I have to put over here, I have to stay here a month, and then I go back to Berlin again. Not in, once you are in American, you are in an inf infantry. Uh, I forgot what that spec number is. It's something there is one. You stay in the infantry. You don't go, uh, you don't get uh, relieved, you stay there. Because then we knew what that meant. Because afterwards when I, when I got limited assignment in it, when I was wounded the third time, I didn't get a third purple heart because the lieutenant was killed. So he didn't put it in and I didn't care. So anyway, that was more democratic. Germany had more democratic army than we have because you had to stay there till you were dead. Just like afterwards, when I came there, when I was wounded the second time, this was the third time, rather. Second time that I was wounded, Lutner was didn't have. A, we went on a patrol at night, and which meant that I should go across the street to go there. It was dark at night. All the training that I had, somehow in the army, there's an old saying, when everything is quiet, sooner or later, all the hell will break loose. So it was quiet. So we were on the house and the lieutenant goes there. So I went, but when I did not look, you take a helmet, you go in the house, 
put that on it there and stick it out like this. This, I didn't do it, I just went across and German was behind a corner. He stick his foot, I, I tripped over his foot and then I was in a, laying in the middle of the street, like a square, laying there. So he goes with his bayonet, he went after me. My rifle and what flew away. So he just stabbed me. I was bleeding like a pig. So his medic afterwards went, Lieutenant jumped back and he finished the German. So we got back, they patched me up. One fella, I took mine off, uh, sweatshirt, and one fella took his also sweatshirt. They put it on to stop the bleeding. So it was not, I mean, that was not that bad. When I got it afterwards, we were on our way to Brest. I think it was called Everange, whatever it is. We got trapped there. And we heard tanks. And there was this, this kid, he was, they said he came from, or that I knew him from England, from Puerto Rico, that he was. He was firing bazooka down. We were, we had advantage. The tanks were coming up. There was a tape on Sunken Road. They were coming up, up the hill. And this, all at once I see him, for, uh, he's uh, loaded for him. He, he was the bazooka man. So all at once he gets it in the face. Oh, he was, he was still gotten because they were, we ducked behind the hedgerow. And the hedgerow was not too heavy. It was very, very light. He was bleeding from the face. So all at once somebody was yelling. They were yelling, don't let the bastards come up. Because if they would have, the tanks would come up they would have wiped us out. We were, we had advantage. We were on the top, and they were coming up. So what was Tiger? Was there? So I fired at him. I took the bazooka and I loaded myself. I fired. When uh, I went to the right, I should have gone to the left. In other words, when you fire, you, you don't stay where you where you fired from, you move someplace else. I moved to the right. When he started to fi uh, fire, that the hedgerow was not. All at once I feel wet. I said, gee, I didn't, I didn't pee. I was thinking, I didn't, I didn't pee. Blood was coming there. I got hit in the guts. Then I got hit in the small ones, like the kid, but I got it in the neck. I got it in the chest. Shrapnel, but here in the guts. And that started to feel funny. First it was hot when I got hit. And when I was bleeding, I, I collapsed. So this, somebody was yelling medics. So medics came over. So he patched me up. And from, the, from them, he gave me injection. I didn't realize, I, I, I was dumb. I didn't know what the morphine is. He gave me, he said, you will feel good after this, when he gave me injection. Sure enough, when he gave me that injection, oh, I didn't give a damn about anything. You feel so good. So this was maybe, I don't know, four o'clock in the evening. When they took me to the first aid station, First day session that they will operate it on in the field hospital. Around four o'clock in the morning, the nurse said, I said, what time is it? Because it started to hurt in there. So, so about four o'clock they operated on me. When they finished, it was in the field hospital. And then we, they moved us on that, uh, 
thing. He, uh, the doctor came over and he said to us, you know, if you, this would have happened to you in World War I, you would be finished. What they did, they, then they put us on, uh, they took us on the uh, thing and we went back to England in the hospital. When you get hit in the guts, they take it, take it out, it's out, make a connection, and when it heals, they go x-ray, whatever they do, doctors know what to do. I stayed in uh, England, I think about a month or two months in that field hospital, till it healed up because part of the thing was sticking out. <laughs> but I think I hit that one of the tanks. But I'm, I'm not sure because he got me after, he got me then. I know I hit, hit him on the track. Nowadays, as I see the tanks have a protection on the, on the uh, rail. They have protection in those days in World War II, they were open, that's where you aim, on the track, to break the track. Now, now you can't, they have a, like I opened there, the tanks, but I see the pictures of the tanks nowadays. Anyway, so I stayed in England. Then they shipped me back to France again. I landed in La Havre, and from La Havre we went to uh, Etops. And meanwhile they told me, you are not going to come back anymore. You are not fitted. So I got a job as a, being in charge of what you're bearing. I couldn't believe it. Then I realized what Patton meant. Three meals a day, no guard duty. I slept on the cot, no foxhole, sleeping in the foxhole. Inside, when it rained, we were in a, a little like a hotel or whatever it was. While you are in combat, you sleep. Lean against the rock if there is a rock. If there is a rock, you lean against the rock and sleep there. Or lay in the foxhole, trying to get in foxhole. I couldn't believe it that I was in the same arm. No guard duty, three meals a day. Oh, that was life for Raleigh afterwards behind the lines. So when we got in the line, we, we talked about it. Now, yes, they said, and he said, one of the fellows, he said, imagine some of those bastards, they were stayed in the army and they put on the big show now. They had it that way all those years that they were in the service. Well, I had, then I knew what Patton meant. That, that was nice that in, in that three times. <clears throat> so how did you get injured a third time if you were behind the lines? I was what? If, how, did, how did you get injured a third time if you were behind the lines? I was not in that third army. No, no, you had third injury. You said you had a third injury well, that wasn't reported. That was with the bayonet. Oh, okay. That, in other words, what when I got the first time. Yes. And the second time. Right. When uh, this was on the record, they put it on the record while I was in England that I was, okay. when I got hit in the guts in the third one. We came, we went on the patrol and when we came back, Lieutenant, as the story goes, he got, his boxer got a direct hit, he was killed right there. So he was, he would have put it in probably, and I didn't push it there. Mm -hmm. Okay. He was nice, that lieutenant was nice. We had a nice lieutenant in England. Then we, shortly before D-Day, told, they told us, if you see him in France, don't talk to him that he's gonna parachute as a free French, a spy to go in there. He had fell by Brooke, uh, his name was Brooks. Second, 
he didn't dare to get in the get in the front of the cross the hedgerow. From hedgerow to hedgerow. Yeah, that first one, I used to call him Frenchy. He was nice. Same way, Colonel. You would, you never hear, very seldom you heard anybody when they talk about Colonels to say, Colonel, my Colonel, he was good too. When he gave you punishment, it was fair. Whatever he did, when you fellas, when they got a pass and overstayed, they were supposed to be court martial. They said, do you want to be court martial or do you want my punishment? Your punishment, sir. His punishment was after you came back from the field in the camp, after you had a child, you had to take a rifle, put it on the sling, take a helmet, and fill it up with a set and walk in attention right on the main main line in the camp. Dump it, walk back. That was a punishment. Did you ever receive any? Did you ever receive any punishment? Yes. For what? I I got the uh, as we used to have once a month. We used to compete. to get on the crow, running, and all kinds of things. And for his two fellas that, got, that would have first got, you got to pass 72 hours to go to London. And I, I met somebody that I went overseas with, who's been 116. 116, I met him. So I always stayed instead of 72 hours. I made it, I think, 100. Under two hours, I overstay. What did you do when you were in London? Well, you went, you went to, most of the time you slept. Or you went to movie or show, or they had a dancing, so you went dancing or talking to them, talking to some of the buddies. I met this fellow from 116 that we went overseas with. The one I got, pro when I got promotion also, I think he was, we went overseas together. With this fellow, and he was already a sergeant. He was a tech sergeant. So he got assigned to take over uh, we were second platoon, first platoon. He took over the first platoon. So this particular night, we went on a night patrol, and with me, I don't. I always told them I don't talk German. They used to say, "You go on the patrol, every patrol," because I I knew, only knew a few. I know a few words in German that I could listen to them. Listen to them and put the information back. We went on the patrol, so I had to go on the patrol. That time I was just playing private. So I went, I had to go. And we were not far away from where we left. When the lieutenant, not lieutenant, the sergeant, he got shot in the arm. I think I'll write out. So we took a training in England. He knew, we knew each other from England and we went overseas together. So he went back, one of the fellas that went with him because he could not fire the rifle anymore. He went back to the camp, uh, back to the, where we were located. And he appointed me, he says, check, you take over. And he still, Pass the word. He said, pass the word. Check is in charge. So I was in. I, I took over. Is that what they called you, Chuck? Yeah, some of them. We used to call each other Irish, Italian, Kraut, Guinea, 
and all that thing. It was good for the passport too at night when you had it because the Germans take him. If you call Joe, then don't you call out anybody Joe German. They were trying to catch Paul. You were dead. So they would go. So since I was when we came in the in the plane, the scout came afterwards when we were finished. Our mission was to bring in one German. So we get information out of him. And the boys get information. So we ran into a couple skirmishes, but we came back and when we went there, there was a big, like a ravine. The scout that came over, he was Indian, American Indian. He was a good guy, very smart, smart fellow from what he was from Oklahoma. He said, Sergeant, we are trapped. The Germans are waiting for us over there. And then we, there was a cliff, you could not go. And then there was a meadow, we are trapped. So meanwhile, what comes, they start to put a flag. The German comes over the white thing they had. They want us to surrender. So we took a vote. There was only one vote, one fellow that voted to surrender. The rest of it, no. So we just told nine. So now, how well we get out of this mess, not to get because they were had it, we had them. Then I remember, I was, I was just private. My grandfather, when he used to tell me, when he used to tell me his story, thing, how Prince got, got out of the castle. So I think maybe it will work. So the only way that we could get that was straight, that I knew, would be our lines, that we will get to our lines, was go through the meadow, but meadow, meadow was flat. So I looked at the thing and I remember what my grandfather told me the story. When the clouds started to come, it was dark uh, on the meadow. So I told a guy with the BAR and two fellas, two fellas next to him, I said, make sure get cross. And once you get cross, stop the defensive position on that side where we will come and go with the cloud. And the, sometimes the uh, cloud would like stop, so you stop. So they don't have to take it on the side. We got all of us, we got a cross. And when I came back and reported at the uh, headquarters, so so I said, I'm sorry, we couldn't, we couldn't get a prisoner. But we got, he said, I heard a report that you fellas were trapped and you were surrendered. I said, no, we are all back. So next day I come back, Brave Chindra report in such and such area to, to the headquarters there. There was captain and fella from a heavy weapon. Uh, I forgot his name. From a heavy weapon. I said, what are you here for? I said, I don't know. He didn't know. So he comes over and he's, he put on, uh, during the game the line, they made him, he got a field commission from heavy weapons, this fellow, because he was firing the um, motor, a 60 millimeter, a 60 millimeter motor, there, so he, and they needed, they needed officers, and he got a field commission, and with me, you did a good job uh, last night, you are a squad leader, that's how I got it, if that had any anything to do with it, my grandfather telling me a story that we got out of the trap. 
one for all, all for one. We had a fella, he was from Massachusetts, Boston. He was one of those, he put that act on more, more than anything else. A con to it and all that thing. And he was a funny guy. If, if you did something with his, fix his, uh, on his rifle, or obey in it, he used to have a, like a white handkerchief or whatever it was, he would wipe it off. In other words, if you touch it, he would wipe it off. And there was a fellow from Alabama. They used to argue with that one. He had that sudden broke, the way he talked. They used to argue, you lousy Yankee, you lousy rebel, and all that thing going back and forth. So this particular time while we were in England, on Mars, we were near the woods, and we got a, we got a chow. So this guy, he never used to curse. One thing, he never cursed. The one that was from Boston. While he, he goes with the chow, goes like this, through the mesky with the food. Son of a, said son of a bitch, that he curses. As the birds were flying, he had it. They did the dropping that the from birds fell right in his mesquite. <laughs> and so he threw it down. And so now he had no child. So go back and get a child. Put one for us, says, put it, let him put it on your arm. So he goes back. He said, they are all out of it, out of the food. The rebel that he used to argue with, he says, here, you lousy Yankee. He gave him part of his food. That's how close we were. <laughs> Every once in a while I think of it, that we were really close. We had, and while we were in England, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> but I was thinking, there he cursed. I don't know what happened because I asked him, asked some of the fellows what happened to him. I didn't see him. I know my friend John. I didn't go to Germ uh, Germany. I went up to Brest two months that I was at Kamba. Up to Br outskirts of Brest. My friend John, he went to Julich, and some of the fellows that went to Julich, I asked them, what happened to John? They said he got it in the garbage, uh, gar garbage field. He was killed. He was, he was strong. He was also strong. They used to say that he was fellas that knew him. He came from Chicago. He was one of the gang leaders in Chicago in that gang. He was nobody dared to with him. He flew around with John. The way he, one guy that Air Force when he had a fight in Launceston that happened quite often in the pub, big Air Force guy, sergeant that comes over, John knocked him down, how he, he would squeeze you, hit you over here on kidney, and you went down, stand again on the left. Nobody dared to fool around with John. Hmm. Well, I think, uh, I think we're finishing up. Is there anything else you want to tell me? No, that's all right. I don't know. I was just reminiscing, uh, reminiscing uh, about uh, whatever you wanted to know. I don't know if you got the information that you wanted to know.